the chamber temperature is much too high and whoever heard of anybody operating that hot anyway? C. Demand that he do something about the toxicity of CLF. 5. To which he replies that, A. He'd like a higher density himself, but that he's a chemist and not a theologian and that to change the properties of a compound you have to consult God about it. B. To get high performance you need energy, and that means a high chamber temperature, and unless they're satisfied with RFNA and UDMH they'll have to live with it. And 4. C. See the answer to A. And then, for the next six months or so he's kept busy telling them, in response to complaints. No, you can't use butyl rubber O-rings with the oxidizer. Do you want to blow your head off? No, you can't use them with the fuel either. They'll go to pieces. No, you can't use copper fittings with the fuel. Of course, your mixture ratio goes off if you put 5 gallons of the oxidizer in a 50 gallon tank. Most of the PF is up in the eulage, and most of the A is down in the bottom of the tank. Use a smaller tank. No, there isn't any additive I can put in the oxidizer that will reduce the vapor pressure of the PF. And no, I can't repeal the first law of thermodynamics. You'll have to talk to Congress. And he dreams wistfully of climbing into a cold martini and wonders why he ever got into this business. 8. Locks and flocks and cryogenics in general. While all this was going on, liquid oxygen was still very much in the picture. The sounding rocket Viking burned it with ethyl alcohol, as had the A4, and so did several experimental vehicles of the early 50s, as well as the Redstone missile. Most of these, too, used the auxiliary power source of the A4, hydrogen peroxide, to drive the feed pumps, and so on. The XI, the first supersonic plane, was driven by an RMI LOX alcohol rocket motor. Other alcohols were tried as fuels to be used with oxygen methanol by JPL as early as 1946, and isopropanol by North American early in 1951 but they weren't any particular improvement over ethanol. Neither was methylal, CH. 3. Oc. 2. Oc. 3. Which Winternitz, at RMI, was pressured into trying, much against his will, he knew it was a lot of foolishness, early in 1951. It seems that his boss had a friend who had a lot of methylal on hand, and if only some use for it could be found. And at NARTS we did some studies for Princeton, using LOX and pure USP type drinking alcohol not the denatured stuff. The only difference we could find was that it evaporated a lot faster than denatured alcohol when a sailor opened a drum to take a density reading. We had some very happy sailors while that program was going on. But something more potent than alcohol was needed for the X-15 rocket-driven supersonic research plane. Hydrazine was the first choice, but it sometimes exploded when used for regenerative cooling, and in 1949, when the program was conceived, there wasn't enough of it around, anyway. Bob Truax of the Navy, along with 104 Ignition Winternets of reaction motors, which was to develop the 50,000 pounds thrust motor, settled on ammonia as a reasonably satisfactory second best. The oxygen ammonia combination had been fired by JPL, but RMI really worked it out in the early 50s. The great stability of the ammonia molecule made it a tough customer to burn and from the beginning they were plagued with rough running and combustion instability. All sorts of additives to the fuel were tried in the hope of alleviating the condition, among them methylamine and acetylene. 22% of the latter gave smooth combustion, but was dangerously unstable, and the mixture wasn't used long. The combustion problems were eventually cured by improving the injector design, but it was a long and noisy process. At night, I could hear the motor being fired, 10 miles away over two ranges of hills, 
and could tell how far the injector design had progressed, just by the way the thing sounded. Even when the motor, finally, was running the way it should, and the first of the series was ready to be shipped to the West Coast to be test flown by Scott Crossfield, everybody had his fingers crossed. Lou Rapp, of RMI, flying across the continent, found himself with a knowledgeable seatmate, obviously in the aerospace business, who asked him his opinion of the motor. Lou blew up, and declared, with gestures, that it was a mechanical monster, an accident looking for a place to happen, and that he, personally, considered that flying with it was merely a somewhat expensive method of suicide. Then, remembering something he turned to his companion and asked, By the way, I didn't get your name. What is it? The reply was simple. Oh, I'm Scott Crossfield. Our first real IRBMs were Thor and Jupiter, and these were designed to burn oxygen and JP4. And the pumps would be driven by a gas generator burning the same propellants, but with a very rich mixture, to produce gases which wouldn't melt the turbine blades. JP had a better performance than alcohol, and getting rid of the peroxide simplified matters. But there were troubles. The sloppy specifications for JP4 arose to haunt the engineers. It burned all right, and gave the performance it should but. In the cooling passages it had a tendency to polymerize. You will remember that the specifications allowed a high percentage of olefins into tarry substances which slowed the fuel flow, whereupon the motor would cleverly burn itself up. And in the gas generator it produced soot, coke, and other assorted deposits that completely fouled up the works. And, of course, no two barrels of it were alike. Also, believe it or not, it grows bacteria which produce sludge. Lox and flox and cryogenics in general 105. But they needed the performance of a hydrocarbon, alcohol would not do. So then what? Finally somebody in authority sat down and thought the problem through. The specifications of JP4 were as sloppy as they were to ensure a large supply of the stuff under all circumstances. But Jupiter and Thor were designed and intended to carry nuclear warheads, and it dawned upon the thinker that you don't need a large and continuing supply of fuel for an arsenal of such missiles. Each missile is fired, if at all, just once, and after a few dozen of them have been lobbed over by the contending parties, the problem of fuel for later salvos becomes academic, because everybody interested is dead. So the only consideration is that the missile works right the first time and you can make your fuel specifications just as tight as you like. Your first load of fuel is the only one you'll ever need. The result was the specification for RPI, which was issued in January of 1957. The freezing point limit was 40 degrees, the maximum olefin content was set at 1%, and of aromatics at 5%. As delivered, it's usually better than the specifications, a kerosene in the CI. 2. Region, with AH-C ratio between 1.95 and 2.00, containing about 41% normal and branched paraffins, 56 of naphthenes, three of aromatics, and no olefins at all. The polymerization and coking problems were solved, but Madoff and Silverman. At Rocketdyne, which was the autonomous division formed at North American to do all their rocket work, weren't entirely happy with the solution, and did extensive experimentation with diethylcyclohexane which, while not a pure compound, was a highly reproducible mixture of isomers, and was easy to come by. The results of their experiments were excellent, the fuel being appreciably superior to RP-1, but it never got into an operational missile. Atlas and Titan I, our first ICBMs were designed around RPI before Madoff and Silverman did their work, and Titan II used storable propellants. The FI motors of Saturn V burn LOX and RPI asterisk. Oxygen motors generally run hot, and heat transfer to the walls is at a fantastic rate. This had been a problem from the beginning, even with regenerative cooling, 
but in the spring of 1948 experimenters. Asterisk locks and RPI never burn absolutely clean, and there is always a bit of free carbon in the exhaust, which produces a luminous flame. So when you're looking at TV and see a liftoff from Cape Kennedy or from Baikonur for that matter and the exhaust flame is very bright, you can be sure that the propellants are locks and RPI or the equivalent. If the flame is nearly invisible, and you can see the shock diamonds in the exhaust, you're probably watching a Titan II booster burning in. 2. Oh. 4. And 50 to 50. 106. Ignition. At General Electric came up with an ingenious fix. They put 10% of ethyl silicate in their fuel, which was, in this case, methanol. The silicate had the happy faculty of decomposing at the hot spots and depositing a layer of silicon dioxide, which acted as insulation and cut down the heat flux. And, although it was continuously ablated and swept away, it was continuously reposited. Three years later, also at GE, Mullaney put 1% of GE silicone oil in isopropanol and reduced the heat flux by 45%. The GE first stage motor of Vanguard used such a heat barrier. Winternets at RMI had similar good results in 1950 and 1951 with ethyl silicate in ethanol and in methylal, and in 1951, with 5% of it in ammonia, he cut the heat flux by 60%. Another tricky problem with an oxygen motor is that of getting it started. From the A4 to Thor and Jupiter, a pyrotechnic start was the usual thing, but the complications were considerable and the reliability was poor. Sanger had used a starting slug of diethyl zinc and Bell Aero Systems, in 1957, went him one better by using one of triethyl aluminum to start an oxygen JP4 motor. This technique was used in the later Atlas and all subsequent oxygen RP motors. A sealed ampoule containing a mixture of 15% triethyl aluminum and 85% of triethyl boron is ruptured by the pressure in the fuel lines at startup, reacts hypergolically with the liquid oxygen. And you're in business. Simple, and very reliable. Alcohol, ammonia, and JP4 or RPI were the fuels usually burned with LOX, but practically every other INF flammable liquid available has been tried experimentally at one time or another. RMI tried, for instance, cyclopropane, ethylene, methylacetylene, and methylamine. None of these was any particular improvement on the usual fuels. Hydrazine was tried as early as 1947, by the Bureau of Aeronautics at EES, Annapolis, and UDMH was tried by Aerojet in 1954. But in this country, in contrast to Russia, the combination of a hydrazine fuel and liquid oxygen is unusual. The only large-scale use of it was in the Jupiter C and the Juno 1 which were propelled by uprated redstone motors, redesigned to burn hydine rather than alcohol. Hydine is a rocketdyne developed 60 to 40 mixture of UDMH and diethylene triamine. Tsiolkovsky's ideal fuel was, of course, liquid hydrogen. It is useless, naturally. In a missile, its density is so low that it takes an inordinate tankage volume to hold any great amount of it, and the engineering problems stemming from its low boiling point are formidable, so it was pretty well left alone until after World War II. Even then, it wasn't exactly easy to come by. There were just three organizations equipped to produce liquid hydrogen in 1947, the Uni. LOX and FLOX and cryogenics in general. 107. University of Chicago, the University of California, and Ohio State, and their combined productive capacity was 85 liters, or 13 pounds, per hour. Assuming that the equipment could be run continuously, which it could not. But in 1948 H.L. Johnson, of the Ohio State Research Foundation, burned it with oxygen in a small motor of about 100 pounds thrust. 
the next year Aerojet installed a 90 liter per hour continuous unit and raised the U.S. capacity to 27 pounds an hour. Aerojet fired it at the 3,000 pound thrust level and used it as a regenerative coolant. Each of the six 200,000 pound hydrogen motors in Saturn V, five in the second stage, one in the third, burns 80 pounds of hydrogen per second. Hydrogen is a super cryogenic. Its boiling point of 21 K is lower than that of any other substance in the universe except helium. That of oxygen is 90 K. Which means that problems of thermal insulation are infinitely more difficult than with oxygen. And there is another difficulty, which is unique to hydrogen. Quantum mechanics had predicted that the hydrogen molecule, H2, should appear in two forms, ortho, with the nuclei of the two atoms spinning in the same direction, parallel, and para, with the two nuclei spinning in opposite directions, anti-parallel. It further predicted that at room temperature or above, three quarters of the molecules in a mass of hydrogen should appear in the ortho form and a quarter in the para. And that at its boiling point almost all of them should appear in the para state. But for years nobody observed this phenomenon. The two forms should be distinguishable by their thermal conductivity. Then, in 1927, D.M. Denison pointed out, in the proceedings of the Royal Society, that the transition from the ortho to the para state might be a slow process, taking, perhaps, several days. And that if the investigators waited a while before making their measurements, they might get some interesting results. Yuri, Brickwetti, and others in this country, as well as Clusius and Hiller in Germany looked into the question exhaustively between 1929 and 1937, and the results were indeed interesting. And when the propellant community got around to looking them up, disconcerting. The transition was slow, and took several days at 21k. But that didn't matter to the rocket man who merely wanted to burn the stuff. What did matter was that each mole of hydrogen, 2 grams, which changed from the ortho to the para state gave off 337 calories of heat in the process. And since it takes only 219 calories to vaporize one mole of hydrogen, you were in real trouble. For if you liquefied a mass of hydrogen, getting a liquid that was still almost three quarters or the hydrogen, the heat of the subsequent transition of that to para hydro. 108. Ignition. Gen was enough to change the whole lot right back to the gaseous state. Oh, without the help of any heat leaking in from the outside. The answer to the problem was obvious find a catalyst that will speed up the transition. So that the evolved heat can be disposed of during the cooling and liquefaction process and won't appear later to give you trouble, and through the 50s, several men were looking for such a thing. P.L. Barrick working at the University of Colorado and at the Bureau of Standards at Boulder, Colorado, came up with the first one to be used on a large-scale hydrated ferric oxide. Since then several other catalytic materials have been found palladium silver alloys, ruthenium, and whatnot. Several of them much more efficient than the ferric oxide and the ortho-para problem can be filed and forgotten. By 1961 liquid hydrogen was a commercial product, with Linda, Air Products, and several other organizations ready to sell you any amount you wanted, and to ship it to you in tank car lots. The design of those tank cars, by the way, is quite something. Entirely new kinds of insulation had to be invented to make them possible. Handling liquid hydrogen, then, has become a routine job, although it has to be treated with respect. If it gets loose, of course, it's a ferocious fire and explosion hazard, and all sorts of precautions have to be taken to make sure that oxygen doesn't get into the stuff, freeze, and produce a murderously touchy explosive. And there is a delightful extra something about a hydrogen fire the flame is almost invisible, and at least in daylight, you can easily walk right into one without seeing it. A rather interesting recent development is slurried, or slush. 
hydrogen. This is liquid hydrogen which has been cooled to its freezing point, 14K, and partially frozen. The slushy mixture of solid and liquid hydrogen can be pumped just as though it were a homogeneous liquid, and the density of the slush is considerably higher than that of the liquid at its boiling point. R. F. Dwyer and his colleagues at the Linda Division of Union Carbide are responsible for much of this work, which is still in the development stage. The 30,000 pound Centaur and the 200,000 pound J2 are the largest hydrogen oxygen motors which have been flown, but motors as large as 1,500,000 pounds, Aerojets MI, are on the way asterisk all. Asterisk it's a shame that Ksiokovsky didn't live to see the MI. It stands 27 feet high, the diameter of the throat is 32 inches, and that of the nozzle exit is almost 18 feet. At full thrust it gulps down almost 600 pounds of liquid hydrogen and a ton and a half of liquid oxygen per second. Konstantin Eduardovich would have been impressed. LOX and FLOX and cryogenics in general. 109. These use electrical ignition. Hydrogen and oxygen are not hypergolic but they are very easily ignited. Gaseous oxygen and hydrogen are admitted to a small pilot chamber, where they are touched off by an electrical spark, whereupon the pilot flame lights off the main chamber. Some work has been done on making oxygen hypergolic with hydrogen, NL. A. Dickinson, A. B. Amster, and others of Stanford Research Institute reported, late in 1963, that a minute quantity, less than a tenth of 1%, of a 3 F 2 in liquid oxygen would do the job, and that the mixture was stable for at least a week at 90 K, the boiling point of oxygen. O 3 F 2 sometimes called ozone fluoride, is a dark red, unstable, and highly reactive liquid produced by an electrical glow discharge in mixtures of oxygen and fluorine at temperatures around 77 K. It has recently been proved that it is really a mixture of O. 2. F. 2. And O. 4. F. 2. However, it doesn't seem likely that electrical ignition of hydrogen oxygen motors will be supplanted for some time. The ultimate in hydrogen motors is the nuclear rocket. As we have seen, in the chapter on performance, the way to get a really high performance is to heat hydrogen to 2000 K or so, and then expand it through a nozzle. And that is just what a nuclear rocket motor does. A graphite-moderated enriched uranium reactor is the energy source, and the hydrogen is the working fluid. During development, one peculiar difficulty showed up. Hydrogen at 2000 K or so dissolves graphite it goes to methane like hot water working on a sugar cube. The answer code the hydrogen flow passages with niobium carbide. The Phoebus 1 motors, tested at Jackass Flats, lovely name, Nevada in 1966, with an 1,100 megawatt thermal reactor, operated successfully at the 55,000 pounds thrust level, with a specific impulse of 760. Impulses above 850 are expected soon. The power rate of change of thermal energy to mechanical energy was thus some 912 megawatts, which implies that the reactor was working somewhat above its nominal rating. The chamber temperature was about 2,300 K. The Phoebus 2 series nuclear engines, under development, are expected to operate at the 250,000 pounds thrust level, greater than the thrust of the J2 and the reactor power, thermal, will be about 5,000 megawatts. This is twice the power generated by the Hoover Dam and the reactor generating it is about the size of an office desk. An impressive little gadget. Liquid fluorine work started about the same time as the liquid hydrogen work did. JPL, starting in 1947, was the pioneer. It wasn't. 110 ignition. 
particularly available at that time, so they made and liquefied the fluorine on the site, a feat which inspires the respect of anyone who has ever tried to make a fluorine cell work for any length of time. They burned it first with gaseous hydrogen, but by 1948 they had succeeded in firing liquid hydrogen, and were using the latter as a regenerative coolant. And by the spring of 1950 they had done the same with hydrazine. Considering the then state of the technology, their achievement was somewhat miraculous. Bill Doyle, at North American, had also fired a small fluorine motor in 1947, but in spite of these successes, the work wasn't immediately followed up. The performance was good, but the density of liquid fluorine, believed to be 1. 108, at the boiling point, was well below that of oxygen, and the military, JPL was working for the army at that time, didn't want any part of it. This situation was soon to change. Some of the people at Aerojet simply didn't believe Dewar's 54-year-old figure on the density of liquid fluorine, and Scott Kilner of that organization set out to measure it himself. The Office of Naval Research put up the money. The experimental difficulties were formidable, but he kept at it, and in July, 1951, established that the density of liquid fluorine at the boiling point was not 1.108, but rather a little more than 1.54. There was something of a sensation in the propellant community, and several agencies set out to confirm his results. Kilner was right, and the position of fluorine had to be re-examined. ONR a paragon among sponsors, and the most sophisticated by a margin of several parsecs funding agency in the business, let Kilner publish his results in the open literature in 1952. But a lot of texts and references still list the old figure. And many engineers, unfortunately, tend to believe anything that is in print. Several agencies immediately investigated the performance of fluorine with hydrazine and with ammonia and with mixtures of the two, and with gratifying results. Not only did they get a good performance, but there were no ignition problems, liquid fluorine being hypergolic with almost anything that they tried as a fuel. Unfortunately, it was also hypergolic with just about everything else. Fluorine is not only extremely toxic, it is a super oxidizer, and reacts, under the proper conditions with almost everything but nitrogen, the lighter of the noble gases. And things that have already been fueling at to the limit. And the reaction is usually violent. It can be contained in several of the structural metal steel, copper, aluminum, etc. because it forms, immediately, a thin, inert coating of metal fluoride which prevents further attack. But if that. Locks and flocks and cryogenics in general 111. Inert layer is scrubbed off, or melted, the results can be spectacular. For instance, if the gas is allowed to flow rapidly out of an orifice or a valve, or if it touches a spot of grease or something like that. The metal is just as likely as not to ignite and a fluorine aluminum fire is something to see. From a distance. But, as is usually the case, the stuff can be handled if you go about it sensibly, and if you want to fire it in a rocket, Allied Chemical Co. will be glad to ship you a trailer truck full of liquid fluorine. That trailer is a rather remarkable device in itself. <laughs> the inner fluorine tank is surrounded by a jacket of liquid nitrogen to prevent the evaporation and escape of any fluorine into the atmosphere. All sorts of precautions pilot trucks, police escorts, and whatnot are employed when one of those trucks travels on a public road. But sometimes I've wondered what it would be like if a fluorine tank truck collided with one carrying, say, liquid propane or butane. The development of large fluorine motors was a slow process, and sometimes a spectacular one. I saw one movie of a run made by Bell Aerosystems, during which a fluorine seal failed and the metal ignited. It looked as though the motor had two nozzles at right angles, with as much flame coming from the leak as from the nozzle. The motor was destroyed and the whole test cell burned out before the operators could shut down. 
but good-sized fluorine motors have been developed and fired successfully, although none have yet flown in a space mission. Rocketdyne built Nomad, a 12,000-pound motor, burning fluorine and hydrazine, for upper stage work, and Bell developed the 35,000-pound chariot for the third stage of Titan III. This burned fluorine and a mixture of monomethyl hydrazine, water, and hydrazine, balanced to burn to CO and HF, and to have a freezing point considerably below that of hydrazine. And GE has developed the 75,000-pound X430 fluorine hydrogen motor. Orton at LFPL, from 1953 on, and then the people at Rocketdyne, in the late 50s and early 60s investigated the possibility of upgrading the performance of an RP LOX motor by adding fluorine to the oxidizer, fluorine and oxygen are completely miscible. And their boiling points are only a few degrees apart, and found that 30% of fluorine in the LOX raised the performance by more than 5%. And could still be tolerated, Rocketdyne burned it in an Atlas motor, by tanks, pumps, etc. which had been designed for liquid oxygen and they got hypergolic ignition, as a bonus. The mixture of liquid fluorine and liquid oxygen is called flux, with the usually appended number signifying the percentage of fluorine. For maxi. 112. Ignition. Mum performance the combination should burn, with the hydrocarbon. To HF and Co, which means that flux 70 is the best oxidizer for RPI at least as far as performance goes. The specific impulse of RPI and liquid oxygen, calculated at 1000 psi chamber pressure, 14. 7 exhaust, shifting equilibrium, optimum O slash F, is 300 seconds, with flux 30 it is 316, with flux 70, which balances to CO and HF, it is 343 seconds, and with pure fluorine it drops to 318. Fluorine is not likely ever to be used for the big boosters all that HF in the exhaust would be rough on the launching pad and equipment. Not to mention the surrounding population and it's more expensive than oxygen by orders of magnitude, but for deep space work it's hard to think of a better combination than hydrogen and fluorine. It's on its way. The future of ozone doesn't look so promising. Or, to be precise, ozone has been promising for years and years but hasn't been delivering. Ozone, O. 3. Is an allotropic form of oxygen. It's a colorless gas, or if it's cold enough, a beautiful deep blue liquid or solid. It's manufactured commercially, it's useful in water purification and the like. By the Wellsbach process which involves an electrical glow discharge in a stream of oxygen. What makes it attractive as a propellant is that. 1. Its liquid density is considerably higher than that of liquid oxygen, and 2. When a mole of it decomposes to oxygen during combustion it gives off 34 kilocalories of energy, which will boost your performance correspondingly. Sanger was interested in it in the 30s, and the interest has endured to the present. In the face of considerable disillusionment. For it has its drawbacks. The least of these is that it's at least as toxic as fluorine. People who speak of the invigorating odor of ozone have never met a real concentration of it. Much more important is the fact that it's unstable murderously so. At the slightest provocation and sometimes for no apparent reason, it may revert explosively to oxygen. And this reversion is catalyzed by water, chlorine, metal oxides, alkalis, and by, apparently, certain substances which have not been identified. Compared to ozone, hydrogen peroxide has the sensitivity of a heavyweight wrestler. Since pure ozone was so lethal, work was concentrated on solutions of ozone in oxygen, which could be expected to be less dangerous. The organizations most involved were the Forestal Laboratories of Princeton University, the Armour Research Institute, and the Air Reduction Co. Work started in the early 50s, and has continued, on and off, 
ever since. Locks and flocks and cryogenics in general. 113. The usual procedure was to run gaseous oxygen through a Weissbach ozonator, condense the ozone in the emergent stream into liquid oxygen until you got the concentration you wanted. And then use this mixture as the oxidizer in your motor run. During 1954-57, the Forrestal fired concentrations of ozone as high as 25%, using ethanol as the fuel. And they had troubles. The boiling point of oxygen is 90K. In working with cryogenics, it's much simpler to think and talk in absolute of Kelvin degrees than in Celsius. That of ozone is 161K. On shutdown, the inside of the oxidizer lines would be wet with the ozone oxygen mixture, which would immediately start to evaporate. The oxygen, with the lower boiling point, would naturally come off first, and the solution would become more concentrated in ozone. And when that concentration approaches 30%, at any temperature below 93 K, a strange thing happens. The mixture separates into two liquid phases, one containing 30% ozone, and the other containing 75%. And as more oxygen boils off, the 30% phase decreases, and the 75% phase increases, until you have only one solution again. All 75% ozone. And this mixture is really sensitive. So, after a series of post-shutdown explosions which were a bit hard on the plumbing and worse on the nerves of the engineers, some rather rigorous purging procedures were adopted. Immediately after shutdown, the oxidizer lines were flushed with liquid oxygen, or with gaseous oxygen or nitrogen, to get rid of the residual ozone before it could cause trouble. That was some sort of a solution to the problem but not a very satisfactory one. 25% ozone in oxygen is not so superior to oxygen as to make its attractions overwhelmingly more important than the difficulty of handling it. A somewhat superior solution would be to eliminate the phase separation somehow, and in 1954-55 GM, Platts of the Armour Research Institute, now ATRI, or the Illinois Institute of Technology Research Institute, had some success in attempting to do this. He showed that the addition of about 2.8% of Freon-13, CCLF-3, to the mixture would prevent phase separation at 90K, although not at 85K. Which meant that if you had, say, a 35% mixture at the boiling point of oxygen, it would remain homogeneous, but if you cooled it to the boiling point of nitrogen, 77K, the high concentration, lethal phase would separate out. W.K. Boyd, W.E. Berry and E.L. White of Battelle and W.G. Maransic and A.G. Taylor of Air Reduction came up with a better answer in 1964-65 when they showed that 5% of of 2 or 9% of F 2 added to the mixture completely eliminated the phase. 114 Ignition. Separation problem. And their addition didn't degrade the performance, as the Freon would have. Nobody has yet come up with an even faintly plausible explanation for the solubilizing effect of the additives. One other ozone mixture has been considered that of ozone and fluorine, which was thoroughly investigated during 1961 by AJ. Gainer of armor. 30% of ozone would be optimum for RPI. But the improvement over Flock 70 wouldn't be too impressive. And the thought of what might happen if the ozone in the oxidizer let go on the launching pad and spread the fluorine all over the landscape was somewhat unnerving. And I have heard of no motor runs with the mixture. For ozone still explodes. Some investigators believe that the explosions are initiated by traces of organic peroxides in the stuff, which come from traces, say, of oil in the oxygen it was made of. Other workers are convinced that it's just the nature of ozone to explode, and still others are sure that original sin has something to do with it.
So although ozone research has been continuing in a desultory fashion, there are very few true believers left, who are still convinced that ozone will somehow, someday, come into its own. FM not one of them. 9. What Ivan was doing. When the Russians moved into Germany, they put the chemists at the Luina works of LG Farben to work at propellant research. True, these weren't propellant men, but to the Russians apparently a chemist was a chemist was a chemist and that was all there was to it. ARPA did something similar in this country a good many years later. At first the Germans didn't do much except determine the properties of the known rocket fuels, but when they were sent to Russia in October 1946, some went to the State Institute of Applied Chemistry at Leningrad, the others to the Karpov Institute at Moscow, they were put to work synthesizing new ones, some to be used neat, some for additives to gasoline or kerosene. For the Soviets, like the Germans before them, were hunting for hypergols, and additives that would make gasoline hypergolic with nitric acid. And, the nature of chemists and of chemistry being what it is, the paths they took were the same ones we took. They investigated the vinyl ethers, as the Germans had done before them, and then, in 1948, four years before NYU did the same thing, they synthesized and tried every acetylenic that they could think of. In 1948 they tried the allylamines, Mike Pino at California Research was doing the same thing at the same time. They investigated the tetralkyl ethylene diamines in 1949, two years before Phillips Petroleum got around to it. And, in 1948 and 1949 they worked over the mercaptans and the organic sulfides, just as Pino was doing. They investigated every amine they could get their hands on or synthesize, and they tried such mixed functional compounds as vinyloxyethylamine. And, 116. Ignition. Everything they made they mixed with gasoline usually a pyrolytic, or high aromatic type, in the hope that they could get a good hypergolic mixture. They even tried elemental sulfur, in some of their mixtures. But for a long time the most satisfactory fuel for their tactical missiles was the German-developed Tonka 250, mixed xylitines and triethylamine. The second stage of the SA-2 or guideline. U.S. designations we don't know theirs, surface-to-air missile used by North Vietnam uses that fuel, along with RFNA. Homemade hydrazine hydrate, rather than capture German stuff, was available in the Soviet Union by 1948, but there was apparently little interest in hydrazine or its derivatives until about 1955 or 1956. When the Soviet chemists, all the Germans had been sent home by 1950, learned of our success with UDMH. The lack of interest may have been caused by the incompatibility of copper and hydrazine, and their engineers liked to make their motors out of copper, because of its beautiful heat transfer properties. And, of course, the Russian climate has a tendency to discourage the use of hydrazine. UDMH, now, is one of their standard propellants. Some work was done with high-strength peroxide, first with captured German material, and, after 1950, with Russian product, but there never was much interest in it, and finally the Navy took over all peroxide work. It's very useful in torpedoes. The nitric acids used in the late 40s and early 50s were a 98% WFNA, WFNA containing 4% of ferric chloride as an ignition catalyst, and a mixed acid containing 10% sulfuric acid. And they had all the troubles with it that we had. They tried organic sulfonic acids methane sulfonic, methane di-antrisulfonic, ethane disulfonic, and ordinary disulfonic acid as corrosion inhibitors in 1950 and 1951, two years before California research tried them, but used them in little more than trace quantities, a percent or so. They didn't work, naturally. But in spite of the nitric acid troubles, one of the Germans bethought himself of Nagarotha's equation relating propellant density to range, 
and decided to make a few points with his new boss's asterisk. Asterisk has a first approximation, the range of a missile is proportional to its boost velocity, squared. And Nagarath related the boost velocity to exhaust velocity and propellant density by the equation. C. B. Equals C in, 1 plus D. B. Is the boost velocity, C the exhaust velocity, D the bulk density of the propellants, and a loading factor the total tank volume of the missile, in liters, say. Divided by the dry mass, all propellants burned, of the missile, in kilograms. So the range depends very strongly upon LE exhaust velocity, but upon the density by A. What Ivan was doing. 117. He decided that AV2 loaded with nitric acid and a really high density fuel would have a range that would make him a hero of the Soviet Union, at least, and set out to make that really high density fuel. So he mixed up 10% of toluene, and 50% of dimethylaniline, and 40% of dibromoethane. He got a high density all right something like 1. 4 but what those bromines did to the specific impulse was a crime. His Russian bosses, who were not fools, took one horrified look at what he was doing, and immediately took all his chemicals away from him. And four weeks later he was hauled up before a people's tribunal, tried, convicted, and fined 4,000 rubles for, in the words of the court, misleading Soviet science. He was lucky. If I had been on the tribunal he'd have gone to Siberia for 90 years, and the charge would have been exuberant stupidity. The Russians were happy when he went back home. With an ally like that who needs enemies. Other attempts at high-density fuels were made, 8% of colloidal aluminum suspended with aluminum stearate in kerosene was one of them. But it froze at 6 degrees, and the investigators lost interest. And they tried various nitro-organics such as nitropropene the name alone is enough to scare me to death as monopropellants, with no success to mention, and, as the Germans had before them. Tried to use tetranitomethane as an oxidizer and blew up a laboratory trying it. Recently they have been showing considerable interest in mixtures of hydrazine nitrate and methyl hydrazine, like my hydrazoid N, but whether they intend it for a fuel or for a monopropellant we don't know. Their first ballistic missile the SSIA, NATO designation, was a carbon copy of the A4, and burned 70% alcohol and liquid oxygen. Liquid oxygen was available in quantity, since the Soviets used the highly efficient and very fast air liquefier designed by Peter Kapitsa. The larger missiles, SS-2, sibling of 1954, and the SS-3 Schyster of 1956 used the same combination, except that the concentration of the alcohol was 92.5 rather than 70%. But, as you may remember, the US specifications for nitric acid, including the HF inhibitor, were published in 1954. So the next Soviet ballistic missile was a redesigned SSIA, the SSIB, or SCUD, and burned kerosene and Irvna. They presumably used a starting slug, perhaps triethylamine, and the kerosene they use is a high logarithmic function which varies with the loading factor. If is very small, as it would be in a plane with JATO attached, the density is almost as important as the exhaust velocity. If it is very large, as an ICBM, the density of the propellants is much less important. 118 Ignition Naphthenic type, very similar to RPI. They prefer this to other types since it is much less liable to coking than, say, a high olefinic mixture when it is used for regenerative cooling. Suitable crudes are abundant in the Soviet Union. There are two rocket grades of Irvna commonly used in the USSR, AK-20, containing 20% of N. 2. O. 4. And AK-27 containing 27%. From the advent of SCUD, 
the presence of two design groups in the Soviet Union has been apparent, and the Soviet High Command, presumably to keep peace in the family, splits development projects between the two. This procedure is not exactly unheard of in this country, where a contract awarded to Lockheed may be followed by one to General Dynamics. One group remains wedded to liquid oxygen, and designed the SS-6, SS-8, and SSIO. SS-6, the monstrous 20-barreled beast that lifted Yuri Gagarin and Vostok I into orbit, burned oxygen, and the equivalent of RPI. SS-8, Saison, and SS-10 burn oxygen and, apparently a hydrazine UDMH mixture equivalent to R50-50. The other group swears by storable oxidizers, IRVNA, or N. 2. O. 4. Using the latter in the big strategic missiles which live in steam-heated silos, and the former usually in shorter-range tactical missiles which have to cope with the Russian winter. The SS-4 sandal uses IRVNA and apparently a mixture of RP and UDMH, compare U. S. Nike Ajax, while the SS-5 IRBM Skeen and the SS-7 ICBM burn acid and UDMH. The recently deployed SS-9 ICBM SCARP, a kissing cousin to the US Titan II, but somewhat larger, burns N. 2. O. 4. With, probably 50 to 50. There has been some conjecture that it may burn MMH, but that appears unlikely. 5050 is much cheaper, gives the same performance or a little better, and with a strategic missile you don't have to worry about the freezing point of the fuel. The smaller SSIL uses the same propellants, and the SS-12, a tactical missile more or less equivalent to the US lands, burns IRVNA and RP. To bring things up to date, the SS-13 is a three-stage solid propellant equivalent to Minuteman, and the SS-14 is essentially, the two upper stages of SS-13. The Soviet naval missiles comparable to Polaris. Use IRVNA or N. 2. O. 4. With UDMH or 50 to 50, or are solid propelled. And the Chinese ballistic missiles under development are based on the SS-3, modified to burn IRVNA and kerosene. As for more advanced, or exotic propellants, the Soviet practice has apparently been more conservative than that of the United States. The Russians did some work with Barans in 1949 to 1950, but had sense enough to quit before they wasted a lot of time and money. There were some firings with 10% ozone in oxygen in East. What Ivan was doing. 119. Germany in 1952, but there is no evidence that this work was followed up. Nor is there any evidence of extensive work with halogenated oxidizers. In a long review article on perchloral fluoride in a Soviet chemical journal recently, all the references were to Western sources asterisk. There has been some mention of of 2. And of the alleged virtues of metal slurries, but nothing to indicate that it amounts to more than words. Nor is there any indication that they have done much with liquid fluorine or with liquid hydrogen, although it would be surprising, to say the least. If the use of the latter in their space program had not been considered. In short, the Russians tend to be squares in their choice of propellants. Oxygen, N. 2. O. Oh. 4. Irvna, RP, UDMH, and its mixes, that's about the lot. When he wants more thrust, Ivan doesn't look for a fancy propellant with a higher specific impulse. He just builds himself a bigger rocket. Maybe he's got something there. Asterisk of course this may mean that they are about to start working with it. Such review articles, in the USSR, frequently signal the start of a research program. 10. Exotics 15 years ago people used to ask me what is an exotic fuel anyway, and I would answer it's expensive, it's got boron in it, and it probably doesn't work. I had intended, originally, 
to entitle this chapter The Billion Buck Boron Boo Boo, but decided against it on two grounds. The first was that such a title might conceivably be considered tactless by some of the people who authorized the programs concerned. The second reason is that it would not be completely accurate. Actually, the Boron programs did not cost a billion dollars. It just seemed that way at the time. The Borans are compounds of Boron and Hydrogen, the best known, although there are many others, being Diborane, B. 2. H. 6. Pentaborane, B. 5. H. 9 and decaborane, B. 10. H. 14. At room temperature the first is a gas, the second a liquid, and the third a solid. Alfred Stock discovered most of the better known Borans between 1912 and 1933, while H. I. Schlesinger, starting about 1930, contributed vastly to the field of borane chemistry, and in particular to the development of synthetic roots. Borans are unpleasant beasts. Diborane and pentaborane ignite spontaneously in the atmosphere, and the fires are remarkably difficult to extinguish. They react with water to form, eventually, hydrogen and boric acid, and the reaction is sometimes violent. Also, they not only are possessed of a peculiarly repulsive odor, they are extremely poisonous by just about any route. This collection of properties does not simplify the problem of handling them. They are also very expensive since their synthesis is neither easy nor simple. Exotics 121 But they possess one property which attracted rocket people to them as hippies to a happening. They have an extremely high heat of combustion gram for gram about 50% more than jet fuel. And from 1937 on, when Parsons at JPL had first considered decaborane, propellant men had been considering them wistfully, and lusting after the performance which might, with luck, be wrung out of that heat of combustion. Nothing could be done about it, of course, until World War II was over. But in 1946 the U.S. Army Ordnance Corps awarded a contract to GE, Project Hermes, to investigate the Borans in depth, and to develop methods of large-scale synthesis. The primary objective was not the development of rocket propellants, but the exploitation of the Borans as fuels for air-breathing engines, primarily jets. But the rocket people, as was inevitable with their preoccupations, got involved anyway. It was Paul Winternitz, at Reaction Motors, who in 1947 made what were probably the first performance calculations on the Borans. He calculated the performance of diborane, pentaborane, and aluminum borohydride, AL, BHJ. 3. All with liquid oxygen. Considering the scantiness and general unreliability of the thermodynamic data, not only on these would be propellants but on their combustion products as well. Not to mention the complexity of the calculations, no computers around then, remember, my admiration of his industry is only equaled by my astonishment at his courage. At any rate, the numbers that came out at the other end of the calculation, whatever their validity or lack of it, looked encouraging. The next step was to confirm them with motor firings. Diborane, the most available of the Borans, was to be the fuel, and liquid oxygen the oxidizer. Diborane was the most available of the Borans, but it wasn't exactly abundant. In fact, there were precisely 40 pounds of it in existence when RMI started work. So the firings were necessarily at a very low thrust level, perhaps 50 pounds, and were extremely short. At that, as the engineer in charge confessed to me many years later, every time I pushed the button I could feel the price of a Cadillac going down the tailpipe. The results, not to put too fine a point on it, did not encourage euphoria. The performance was dismally bad far below theoretical. And solid glassy deposits appeared in the throat, changing its size and shape, 
and in the diverging, downstream, section of the nozzle. These consisted, apparently, mostly of B. 2. O. 3. But appeared to contain some elemental boron as well. This was a sure indication of poor combustion, and was not encouraging. 122 Ignition Ordian and Rowe, at NASA Lewis, fired the same combination in 1948, and got much the same sort of results. Nor were the results any better when they used hydrogen peroxide as the oxidizer. The glassy deposits seemed to be as characteristic of boron firings as was the bright green exhaust flame. The next fuel that RMI tried was the dimethylamine adduct of diborane not exactly a borane, but a close relative. But when they fired it with oxygen, in 1951, the results were borane results and discouraging. So were there results with pentaborane, which Jack Gould fired the next year in a 50-pound thrust motor, using oxygen and hydrogen peroxide as oxidizers. It would be some 12 years before anybody could get good results with that last combination. One with better combustion efficiency was fired by Orden in 1955 diborane and fluorine. Here, at least, there weren't any deposits in the nozzle BF. 3. Is a gas but the combination was a fiendishly hot one, and very difficult to handle. The early borane firings weren't, on the whole, too successful, but enthusiasm, hopes, and expectations were all high, and two meetings on boron fuels and would-be fuels were held in 1951 alone. Some awfully dubious chemistry was presented at these meetings. The big breakthroughs in boron chemistry were yet to come, but everybody had a good time and came home inspired to renewed efforts. And very soon they had the money to make these efforts. Project ZIP was started in 1952 by Bouladenaire of the Navy. It was designed to carry on from where the Hermes project had left off and to develop a high-energy, boron-based fuel for jet engines. This was before the day of the ICBMs, the long-range bomber carrying nuclear bombs was the chosen weapon of deterrence in the Cold War. And anything that would increase the range or the speed of that bomber was very much to be desired. The major prime contractors, each with multi-million dollar contracts, were the Owen Matheson Chemical Corporation and the Gallery Chemical Co. But by the end of the decade many more organizations, propulsion, chemical, academic you name it, had become involved, either as minor prime contractors or as subcontractors to the primes. By 1956 the program had become so unwieldy that it had to be split, with the Air Force monitoring Olin Matheson's work and the HEG program and Navy's bullet in air watching over calories zip. The trade journals played up the zip and superfuels, omitting, naturally, the classified chemical details. Which, if published, might give some people pause, and legions of trusting and avaricious souls went out and bought boron stocks. And, eventually, lost their shirts. Exotics 123 It soon became evident that in order to attain the desired physical properties, similar to those of jet fuel, the fuels would have to be alkyl derivatives of the Barans. In the end, three of these were developed and put into fairly large-scale production. Matheson's HEG-2 was propyl pentaborane. Calories HIGAL-3 and Matheson's HEG-3 were mixtures of mono-D and triethyl decaborane, and HIGAL-4 and HEG-4 were mixtures of mono di tri and tetramethyl decaborane. Both minus 3 and minus 4 contain traces of unsubstituted decaborane. The missing numbers represented the fuels in an intermediate stage of synthesis. The chemistry of the boron hydrides was investigated as it had never been investigated before. Process details were worked out on the pilot plant level, two full-sized production facilities, one calorie, one Matheson, were built and put on stream, Handling and safety manuals were written and published and the whole thing was done on a crash basis. 
never had one poor element been given such concentrated attention by so many chemists and chemical engineers. And then the whole program was brought to a screeching halt. There were two reasons for this, one strategic, one technical. The first was the arrival of the ICBM on the scene, and the declining role of the long-range bomber. The second lay in the fact that the combustion product of boron is boron trioxide, B. 2. O. 3. And that below about 1800 degrees this is either a solid or a glassy, very viscous liquid. And when you have a turbine spinning at some 4000 RPM, and the clearance between the blades is a few thousandths of an inch, and this sticky, viscous liquid deposits on the blades. The engine is likely to undergo what the British, with precision, call catastrophic self-disassembly.